Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today, mm -hmm. our guest is Kelvin Young. Kelvin is a community health worker, a certified sound healer, a recovery coach, recovery support specialist, mm -hmm. and founding member of to, um, tell me if I'm saying this wrong. Toivo? Toivo, yes. Toivo. Oh, got that right. Mm -hmm. A peer run holistic healing center in Hartford. He also yes. serves on the board of directors at Manchester's Connecticut Hope Initiative, Eat mm -hmm. the Sunlight Health Incorporated, and A Promise to Jordan Incorporated. He is an active member of the International Association of Peer Supporters and Connecticut Alcohol and Drug Policy Council. He was presented with the 2017 Dr. F. Marcus Brown Memorial Integrative Medicine Award for commitment in co cooperating integrative medicine within the Connecticut Valley Psychiatric Hospital and was also inducted into the Connecticut Hall of Change in September of 2020. Calvin was featured in a documentary called Uprooting Addiction and mm -hmm. the author of Finding Freedom Behind Bars, A Journey of Self-Discovery and Healing, where he shares his story of trauma, addiction, incarceration, and three keys that have helped to move forward without turning back to self-destructive ways of coping or simply giving up. Well, yeah. welcome. I'm so excited <laughs> to have you here. Thank you so much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here, Anna. And it just thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. You've had quite a journey. Yes. Um, quite a journey. And you know, I don't believe that anything happens randomly. So your journey mm -hmm. has brought you to a place where you can help others. How yes. did you get to the place you are now from where you were? That's a good question, Anna. Um, you know, after many years of battling with depression, anxiety, and, you know, a drug addiction, I found freedom from alcohol, from marijuana, from cocaine, uh, from heroin, and even prescription opiates like Oxycontin, Vicodins, and Percocets. And for me, I began my healing journey in a drug treatment program within prison. And it was within this prison program that I learned about the transformative powers of yoga, meditation, sound healing, even creative expressive arts like poetry and journaling. And, you know, I had a lot of misconceptions about yoga, about meditation, all these different mind-body practices. And to be quite frank, I didn't see a lot of people that looked like me practicing these modalities. I didn't see people of color practicing yoga or, or meditation. So I didn't think it was for me. But I know the things I was doing prior to going to prison, it wasn't working for me no more. So I had to try something new. I had to try something different. And by stepping out of my comfort zone and utilizing meditation as a vehicle to go within, because I truly do believe that healing begins from within. I was able to find a sense of calmness and inner peace, even being in a very hostile and you know restrictive environment such as prison. But most importantly, I was able to understand the root causes of my experiences with addiction. And from my lived experience, I learned that it was the unhealed emotional pain that I experienced in my life, um, the unprocessed trauma that I endured, going back all the way to childhood. So at the root of my addiction, was the unhealed emotional pain that I experienced in my life, the toxic chronic stress and the unprocessed trauma that I endured going back to childhood was at the root of my addiction. So I was reaching for something outside of myself to find a sense of relief from that distress. And for me, I found it in alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, and a prescription opiates. And it worked for a while for me until it didn't work anymore. And I got caught up in that very vicious cycle of addiction. And that was a very powerful, powerful learning experience for me. And Anna, I can sit here today and say I'm grateful for my experiences of being incarcerated, even my experiences being um, addicted to alcohol and other drugs, because it wasn't for those experiences, I wouldn't be the man that I am today. And I'm able to like learn from that experience and share the different modalities to people from all walks of life, which became a passion of mine because of that lived experience, because going through that trauma, because going through that experiences with incarceration and addiction and learning tools in prison to help me to deal with those emotional distresses and addictive states. And now I have opportunities to offer it to other human beings that's going through similar experiences um, like me. That's, you know, to me, that's, that's life, that's living, you know, learning something, 
and giving it back to other people. So, you know, through the meditation and through some of the other things you've learned in prison, has it increased your spirituality? Absolutely. You know, for me, like meditation is a great way to um, connect with uh, the divine. And it was a great practice for me to kind of like really go within, you know, and really connect to the true essence of who I am. And, you know, having the opportunity to be in prison and, and learn about meditation um, allowed me to um, just really unpack everything that I was holding within inside of myself. I didn't realize it, and it was being a barrier to um, that spiritual um, connection that I have within me. And one of the tools that I learned to really help me to process that and help me to um, really just expand on my spirituality was expressive arts through poetry. And by meditating, I was able to connect to those emotions that I suppressed and repressed for a very long time. And I was able to bring it to the conscious awareness so I could process those emotions, integrate them, transmute them, and release them and heal them. And I love to share a poem that I wrote uh, while I was in the drug treatment program in prison. And it was very therapeutic for me then. It's therapeutic for me now to share it with all of you tonight. And the name of this poem is called Eyes of a Silent Sun. Look into my eyes and tell me what you see. Is it a lost soul with no control, trying to be free? As I look into the mirror and stare into my eyes, I see all the anger and self-hate, hypocrisy and lies. I see resentment, frustration, embarrassment and pain. I see jail bars and fancy cars as I cruise down memory lane. I see the feelings I repressed going back to childhood. I need to let go of those feelings. I would if I could. I see the hurt that I caused to the ones I love the most. I see my brother on his wedding day as we celebrate with a toast. I see the good and bad times that I experienced in my life. But it's so hard to let go of all that bitterness and strife. There's a sense of sadness when you look into my eyes, like the ones you see when a close relative dies. But this death is not physical. It has to do with the soul. It's that morbid feeling we get when our spiritual energy is low. It's like nothing matters anymore, like that day when I was fired, feeling depressed and weak, can't sleep, but I'm so tired. I'm tired of all the pain, the hurt, and the rain from that cloud that keeps following me. Sometimes I think I'm insane, but when I look out the window and see the beauty of the lake, it reminds me of good times, like when I was nine and things were fine. And with the sunrise, I can feel the presence of the creator. When I look out my window, I see me and the beauty of nature. I'm a part of God's creation, nature, and humanity. The love and spirit that's in Jesus is also in me. So I learned to love myself and others just for who we are. And I learned all about this love looking out my window with jail bars. And for me, I learned about love in a very unusual place. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I learned about love in a very unusual place, in prison, behind bars. And by practicing meditation, I was able to connect to the shame and guilt that often keep people like myself in that very vicious cycle of addiction. But through that process, I was able to move past the shame and the guilt and connect to the true essence of who I am. And I believe the true essence that each and every one of us are. And that essence I'm talking about is the unconditional agape love. And for me, love is more than just a human emotion. I believe that love is a vibration, it's a frequency, and it's our natural state of being. So once I was looking out the windows of bars and understanding that the same divine love and essence that created the sun, the moon, the stars, all the beauty of nature, created me, created each and every one of you, that allowed me to shift my mentality and perspective in my worldview, the way I see myself, my others, and people in it, in a very powerful way. You know, instead of looking at myself from a victim mentality, oh, I'm an addict, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a convicted felon, I'm a high school dropout, I was able to shift that perspective to a more empowered mentality, that I'm a person that's in recovery from alcohol and other drugs. And if I want to get metaphysical, I understand that I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. And I believe that life is about learning, growing, and evolving. 
you know, I learned from my so-called negative experience in my life, and I gained so much knowledge um, from those experiences. And the knowledge I attained allowed my consciousness to evolve. And as a result, I became more consciously aware of the choices I make in my life. And today I sustain my health and my recovery by eating a plant-based diet, because I believe what we consume in our bodies does affect our mental, emotional, and physical well-being. I practice sound healing on a consistent basis. Um, listen to uplifting and relaxing music, different types of body movement, whether it's Qigong, going for a walk, going for a hike, um, just moving my body, getting the energy flowing within my body. Um, and just listening to uh, different types of music, but also connecting to people that's in my life. Because I believe that connection is the cure for feelings of isolation, loneliness, depression, and different other types of emotional distresses that we experience in our lives. So having the opportunity to gain all that, that wisdom and that experience uh, from meditating by going within and understanding the true essence of who I am, that brought me close to my creator. That, that brought me closer to my spirituality. And I grew up in a very religious family. So therefore the spiritual essence was always around but it wasn't until I went to prison that I learned about the true essence of Jesus. And to me, there's a difference between um, the teachings of Jesus and Christianity. And for me, I learned about Jesus. You know, he talked about, about love, love for ourselves, love for others as ourselves, because we are one and love for the divine, creator source. And once I was able to experience that and really embody that experience for myself, not because of, of my religious upbringing, because of my own personal experience I had with the divine that allowed me to evolve my spirituality in a much deeper, intimate and authentic way. You know, whereas I don't necessarily have to go to a building to worship and to honor the, the divine. And that's something I had to learn from my own experience. How did this all affect the people that were in your life when your life wasn't so great? Like you come out of prison, mm -hmm you were like a butterfly coming out of a cocoon. Mm -hmm. you're, this, you're this new version of you. Mm -hmm. How did they accept that? It was a challenge at first because, you know, being in prison, I had this desire to live a life uh, without the use of alcohol and other drugs, just to shift, you know, and my, and my shift, my, my, my evolution was, was gradual, you know, but being in prison, about to be released from prison, I had a desire to, you know, live a different life. And it, it was exciting, but it was also nerve wracking for me as well, too, because this is, was a lifestyle that I lived pretty much, you know, over half my life, you know, at that time, you know, and, you know, I developed relationships and connection with people, including my brothers, I have four older brothers and three of them, you know, how we bonded, how we connected you were through alcohol, through drugs, you know, this is how we, we connected, if that makes sense. And even with my my close friends, you know, that I knew for 20 plus years, you know, this is how we bonded. So therefore coming out and, and really developing a different relationship with them was very like nerve wracking. And if, if I was filled with anxiety, just thinking about that, but I had the desire and I didn't want to turn back from that desire. And, I'll, and I had to learn to love a lot of people from a distance, including my own family. You know, and it was awkward at first going in certain places, doing certain things. But the way I wanted to live my life and the way they were living their life was two different paths. And, you know, no judgment on on um, on their path. But for me, I knew the path that I needed to go in my life. And I had to, I had to, I had to stick with it, you know. And it, it was it was it was awkward at first, but I learned to um respect their choice and they will learn to respect my choice. And that's what it boils down to me for me, was respect for our lives, you know, and the life that we choose to live. And sometimes it takes courage to step out mm. and say, this is my change, this is who I need to be. But yeah, supported by God, you know, it, it, mm. it always tends to work out. Do you that's... also have a child? Yes, I have a daughter, um, Tatiana, um, and she was, um, yeah, she was my inspiration for me to find an inner motivation within myself to make the necessary changes I needed to make in my life. I never forget about, you know, being my last time I was in prison, just laying in my 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 bunk bed and just the feeling of sick and tired of being sick and tired was was all over me. 
you know, and I would think about my daughter, how she see me um, intoxicated, high out of my mind, or alcohol and heroin. Uh, she see me physically, verbally, uh, financially abusive to her mother. Uh, she see me doing all types of criminal activities. So I'm, I know that it caused a lot of pain and trauma in her life. And it's just thinking about that, it caused a lot of hurt and pain within my life. And just sitting there, I just wanted to make some changes in my life because I wanted to be the man that my daughter could look up to and be proud of. And that inspired me to take advantage of all the program that was available while I was in prison. And the drug treatment program really helped me the most and really helped me to change my life. But she was that source of, of inspiration for me to find that motivation. And to this day, you know, um, you know, we have a, a better relationship now, um, you know, a better connection now. And I never forget the first time, you know, coming out of prison, just make all the necessary changes. How she said that she was proud of me, you know, that that's that in itself is success right. to me. Yeah. You know, it's beautiful. How do you um, how do you use sound healing in your work? And, and, you know, what does it do for people and what does it do for you? Yeah, sound healing is just really, I remember when I first got out of, out of prison and even in prison, I listened to headphones and we had like relaxing sounds, ambient sounds, um, sounds from the metal bowls and different things like that. But when I was released from prison, my daughter's mother, she took me to a live sound healing session. And oh my goodness, it was just phenomenal. You know, just experiencing uh, the gong, the crystal singing bowls, uh, the Himalayan bowls, the drum, all those different healing tools. You know, it just, it brought me to another place of just inner peace. And the one word, or maybe two words that I can describe um, that I felt after that, that session was unconditional love. I feel like I was one with all that is. And I fell in love with that experience right there and then. And that's why I really wanted to dive deep and to learn about sound healing. Do you play all of those instruments? Yes, yes. I play, um, you know, during my sound healing sessions, I utilize the crystal singing bowls, uh, which is made out of quartz crystals, mm -hmm. uh, the different uh, metal bowls from Nepal. Um, I use the ocean drum, the gong, um, uh, the the hand drum, uh, the tingshaws, the, the different um, rattles, and different other healing tools to help us to activate and stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, also known as the relaxation response, to help us to calm our minds, to relax our bodies, to feel our emotions and to nourish our souls. And the meditative sounds produced from these healing instruments, it promotes healing from chronic stress, muscle tension, our physical pain that we may feel in our bodies, feelings of anxiety, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, any sleep issues, and different other stress-related chronic health conditions that we experience in our lives. And how sound healing works is through the process of entrainment. When we are trained with the sounds and the vibrations and frequencies from those different healing tools, it takes us from the waking state and scientific term is known as the brainwave of, of beta. And it takes us from the waking state of beta down to an alpha state, which is a relaxed state. And some people go deeper into a more um, um, deeper meditative state known as uh, the uh, theta or delta state, which is a more deeper meditative state. And it is in that alpha, theta, uh, delta state is, is for me is known as, particularly that the theta state is known as the healing state because we're, we're absolutely relaxed. And we're in, in a relaxed state. Our bodies have a natural, innate ability to heal itself. But one of the challenges that we face in our modern day society is we're constantly bombarded by external stimulus coming at us from electronic devices, um, different technologies, social media. And don't get me wrong, all these different technologies, it, it has its place in our modern day society. But when we don't take time to unplug from the matrix of life, unplug from electronic devices, and simply just be and sit with ourselves, even though it could be very scary and very intense sitting with ourselves, sitting with our emotions. But when we learn just to, to simply just be and process those emotions in a healthy way and just sit with it, even sit in that dis discomfort, it's very healing, it's very therapeutic. And, you know, I work with people from all walks of life, um, have opportunities to work with people that's incarcerated, where, you know, now I'm able to go through uh, the front doors in the prison instead of through the back doors and shackles, you know, which is, which is great. 
and I'm, I'm able to introduce uh, people while they're in prison about how to calm themselves, how to relieve stress, and how to connect to the, their inner essence. Um, I work in addiction treatment um, center. I work with mental health um, centers as well, too. Um, different yoga studios, wellness centers, different people from all walks of life. Because I believe that, you know, living in this life, you know, we experience in some type of emotional distress or some type of addictive states. I think it's part of the human experience. Mm -hmm. But we have different modalities that we can deal with that help us to bring us back home, back into homostasis, back into balance. is very helpful for our overall health and well-being. And sound healing is one of those modalities that can help us to do that. It really touch us in a very holistic way, meaning mentally, emotionally, spiritually, as well as physically. How do you address the stigma about mental health and addiction issues in this country? Um, I talk about it. I talk about my own personal experience. And usually by by sharing my, my experience, it gives people permission to do the same, you know, let people know that they're not alone. And, you know, to me, I believe that addiction is a human experience, not a human identity. Because behind the so-called addict, behind the so-called alcoholic, is a human being that experienced a significant amount of trauma, emotional distress, and toxic chronic stress, and just looking for a sense of relief from that distress. And we live in a culture and a society that conditions us to reach for something outside of ourselves when we're dealing with any type of pain, whether it's a physical pain or emotional pain. You know, as a kid growing up, if I ever had a toothache or a headache, I was conditioned to reach for aspirin and Tylenol and whatever, things like that. And for me, I use a physical painkiller such as Oxycontin, Vicodins, and Percocets to deal with an emotional pain. And like I said, it worked for a while until it didn't work and I got caught up in that very vicious cycle of addiction. But I wasn't able to see that very vicious cycle that I was in. But the people that truly cared about me, my, my friends, my family, the people that had the, my best interest at heart, they was able to see that very vicious cycle that I was in. So when I talk to people about these experiences uh, with mental health challenges and, and addiction issues that I have, you know, that's how we, we normalize our human experience and humanize um, different things that we go through in our life by speaking about it, taking away the stigma associated with it because these are human experiences that we have and it's okay to seek support. One of the things that I see with, with COVID-19, which is a physical and mental health crisis, but it's also economic crisis as well too. Many people lost their jobs, um, lost their businesses. I know friends that lost their yoga studios. Um, unemployment rate is high right now. The suicide rate is high right now. The addiction rate is high right now. Domestic violence rates is high right now. Child abuse rates are high right now. All that tells me that a lot of people are dealing with some very intense emotions and don't have healthy outlets to release those emotions. You know, and having like conversations about how we're feeling, you know, what's going on with ourselves, having check in with ourselves and see what's going on with ourselves emotionally, internally, you know, with our thought process, with the sensations within our bodies. I found that more people are having these conversations now and more people are open to seeking clinical support you know, from a therapist, from a counselor, you know. Um, so I believe that we're working in the right direction of, of, of really um, destigmatizing um, some of the mental health challenges that we face in our lives and really uh, destigmatizing um, um, getting support um, when needed, you know, because a lot of us dealt, are dealing with some very intense times right now. And knowing that it's okay to not be okay, but it's also okay to seek support uh, when needed, you know, just like if, you know, weakness to get, right. It's a, I mean, it's courage to seek support and it's work. You right. know, after so long, people thought, oh, if I do that, I'm weak because I can't fix myself. Mm -hmm. you know, that's why we're all in this together. Right. To help each other. So Absolutely. Do you, do you speak to that? Like, do you do like sessions, like, you know, speaking to the public on Zoom, or are you doing it? Like, how are you? How are you getting through the people now in the middle of a pandemic? Well, I still um, host um, in-person sessions. We keep it uh, to a minimum. Um, we do all the uh, the protocols um, for um, you know for safe practicing. Um, but I've also been doing a lot of Zooms, a lot of virtual um, events as well too, which is um, you know which is which is great. It's a way to connect with people. Um, but I really like the in-person connection, particularly with sound, because not only 
um, you, can you hear the sounds in person, but you can feel the vibrations of the sounds when you're doing a live session, you know. But, you know, just the other day, I went to um, a high school and, you know, I talked to um, the students there where I shared my experience with mental health challenges and addiction issues and trauma and some of the challenges that they face in their life. And I talk about the, the school to prison pipeline, particularly how that affects, um, you know, people of color. You know, so, you know, I talk about real issues that affect um, um, real people. You know, I, I don't try to sugarcoat when I talk to um, these teenagers because they have a lot of stuff that's going on with themselves as well, too. Not only, you know, the pressure they, they have from their from their peers, but a lot of the, uh, the students that I talk to, they're dealing with a lot of difficulties at home as well, too, whereas there's poverty, whereas there's systemic racism. There's also um, neighborhood violence. So much things that's going on um, in, their, in their homes, in their communities, um, that they don't feel safe enough and comfortable enough and vulnerable enough to share. And particularly as a male, including myself, you know, I suffered in silence for a very, very long time because our society conditions us to like um, say it's a sign of weakness for men to show their emotions or show their feelings. And the only emotion that is susceptible for men to show is anger, you know? And for me, that anger quickly turned into rage when I was under the influence of alcohol and other drugs. But I, I host um, weekly uh, or bi-weekly men's groups where we have these conversations and they're in person as well as Zoom as well too. We have these conversation about fatherhood, about toxic mas masculinity, about different things that affect um, um, males um, in our culture, in our society. And it's time to really address those issues. Know that it's okay to talk about our emotion and feelings because we're human, <laughs> you know? We have these things, we have these things. It's okay to um, to have these conversations about it and not be shamed and not, not um, have the desire or feel like we gotta suppress uh, what's inside of ourselves, you know? But, you know, because the problem, I see this because mm -hmm. of what I do, you know, I am dealing with people who have lost children who have OD'd or have suicide. It crosses the race line. You know, for different reasons, you know, I mean, there's different reasons why these things happen, but mental illness, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't care who it goes to, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's more of an issue that we should be looking at from every single angle, you know, mm -hmm. like it's a societal issue. You know, they, they are saying that, you know, on the wake of the pandemic, the next, next pandemic is a mental health pandemic, which as you mm -hmm. said, it will increase suicide and you know, people using drugs. A couple of years ago, you know, 600 people in Connecticut alone, you know, OD'd. That's mm -hmm. a huge amount of people, you know? Um, and it was up like tenfold from the years prior to this. You know, it's, it's A, very available, okay? Mm -hmm. Peer pressure, no matter where you live, you know, there's peer pressure. Mm -hmm. um, there's pain of being a teenager, you know? Yeah. Being a teenager sucks, okay? Mm -hmm. You don't know who you are. You don't know who you want to be. You're being stressed from your family, from the school, from your friends, from yourself. You're trying mm -hmm. to find that place. And so what happens? You know, people start experimenting. Yes. And then all of a sudden they got a problem, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and you're right. It's not about the addiction. It's about what's underneath the addiction. Absolutely. That we all need to address. Mm-hmm. Um, so you talk about three keys that have helped you move forward without turning back. What are those three keys? Yeah, the, the things that I've learned while incarcerated was very instrumental for my life, you know. And one of the keys I realized that, you know, underneath that addiction was the trauma, was the emotional pain that was unresolved, unhealed. It was the toxic, toxic stress that I didn't realize that I was under because it was a, a normal way of living. Mm -hmm. And once I was able to see that, and, 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 and like kind of name that, I was able to do something about that. So the first key was for me was doing the inner work. So I had to address those trauma issues, address that emotional pain, to address that toxic stress by seeking a therapist, by learning different mind body practices to help me to reduce my high stress levels, even being in prison in a very hostile and restrictive environment. You know, um, you know really, doing that inner work of learn about um, addiction and how it affects the, the brain and the body um, and, and how it, it, um, 
you know, it alters the way um, that we see things. And, you know, really learn about all of that with therapy and, and these mind-body practices, I was able to begin the inner work I needed to do, you know? And the second key also was for me to put together some goals in my life. You know, while I was in prison, 95 people, 95 percent of people that's in prison, they go home. You know, they, they have a release date. So I had a release date. So I had an opportunity to prepare myself while I was in prison. So right now some goals, what I want to do with my life. You know, I was doing the inner work. I was doing the, the inner changing. But OK, now how do I put this inner changing and put it into practice um, in my life by putting together some goals, you know, in a plan of action? And sometimes you got to make a plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to, to Z, you know, but having a plan of action is so, so important for me. And the third key was um, developing the, the, and creating a, a support network, a support system, whether it's, you know, professional supports from a therapist, clinician, um, or, or other psychiatrist, medical doctor, or even natural supports from my family, our friends, our loved ones, the people that have our best interests at heart, or even community supports from um, the 12 step community or our churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, you know, community agencies. Whatever it is, you know, we need that support because we're, we're social beings. We thrive in community, we thrive in connection, and we can't do this alone. You know, regardless of our experiences in life, we can't do this alone. So we need each other. So creating a support network, a, a team to really help us to achieve our goals, help us to, you know, do the inner healing that we need to do in our lives so we can move forward and, and reach our full potential, whatever that may mean for us. And, you know, those are three keys that really helped me to, um, to really change the trajectory of my life in the direction that I wanted to go in, in a very intentional way. Well, you did a great job and you're helping <laughs> so many people. So what's next for you? Do you have plans about what you're going to be doing when this pandemic is over? Um, I feel like I'm going to be doing um, this, you know, the same thing. It's just really, um, you know, just uh, giving people permission to be human, you know, whatever that means for um, an individual. Know that it's okay to, to have these experiences in our life, you know, whether, you know, um, you know, we, we call it um, uh, mental illness, which I choose not to use that word because that word itself is so stigmatizing. But, you know, if I need to describe someone's, you know, experiences with emotional distress, um, I'll say a person, um, you know, um, having a mental health condition or, or mental health challenge, you know, in, in itself or people that have experiences uh, with addiction. Um, you know, language does matter when it comes to these things. Um, and, and, and I make an effort to, you know, kind of talk about uh, putting people first because people are more than um, their diagnosis, more than um, their disease, um, more than those things that, that people label themselves. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes a label could put people in a box, you know? Um, so therefore understanding that we all are human and we have these different experiences and just really utilizing different platforms to let people know that we can be authentically ourselves. You know, just be you, be ourselves, you know, with the flaws and all, and just learn how to, how do we honor our divineness as well as our humanness, you know, and that makes up to me that I believe that that makes up the totality of who we are in this existence. So really just honoring all of that instead of have to wear these masks all the time, you know, and for me, I wore this mask so, so comfortably, you know, I mean, it, it became a part of me, you know, and it had to be, it had to take me to go to prison and kind of like, you know, go through a, a very intense transformation, you know, for me to kind of like for the mask to, to break off, you know, and there's layers to it, I believe, you know, but it, it's cracking off, it's peeling off, and I'm able to uh, let my authentic self shine. And when you're able to do that and talk about it, I really believe that I give people permission to do the same thing and just know that we, we need each other in community. So developing like different, um, community care as well too because we talk about self-care which is very important individually but let's talk about community care as well too you know where we create these wellness clinics you know that's at no cost for people whether it's virtually or in-person sessions you know how do we take care of one another in a holistic way in our communities how do we support each other in, in different situations in our communities so it's just really developing 
um, these spaces, these these opportunities for us to to truly be human and understand that it's okay uh, to be not okay. It's okay to have these raw, intense emotions, and it's okay to seek support um, when we need it. Well, you're such an inspiration for people, you know, and, you know, I agree. It's about getting out and meeting people. You mm -hmm. know, and one of the things that prevents people from doing that, especially the younger generation, is everything they do is on their phones or <laughs> they, I mean, they find dates on their phones. I mean, very yeah. different than when I grew up. <laughs> on social media and social media does have a place. OK, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you have a very active Facebook page. Mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and you put out such wonderful things there, which is how I connected with you. And if anybody mm -hmm. wants to go on his page, it's just under his name. So it's Kelvin Young. Mm -hmm. um, and he puts out some wonderful things. But you do more than that. Then you get out. So we just can't be, we can't just have blinders on. You know, we have to right. open, open up, you know, yes. completely. So I have to tell you something. There's a man standing behind you. Can I, can I tell you this? Yes, absolutely. Um, do you have someone who's passed whose name is James? Yes. Um, he loves you very much. Mm. Okay. He's very, very proud of you. Okay. But mm. he's also saying that um, he's sorry for whatever part or even if it's the closing of the eyes. Does that make sense to you? Mm. But he loves you and he's supporting you and he's following through you with this. He's pushing you forward. He's saying you are a braver man than he ever was. Mm. Wow. Does that makes uh, sense. Thank you. Absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. That's that's very emotional. <laughs> you know, that's my brother. You know, and I and you know, he had a design company named called BU, you know, and um he passed away a couple of years ago in an automobile accident. A complication from automobile accident and um yes everything you're saying is, is so true because he, he said it so thank you he's so much for sharing that you and he's helping you mm, okay. yes so thank you so much for coming on god mm -hmm. bless you thank you so much that was so powerful thank you for sharing that that meant the world to me for you saying uh, that I'm, you. I'm happy because yes. you know um you bring so much joy to so many people that you have to know um, not only are you supported here, but you're supported so much from the other side. Mm, thank you so much. And to thank all my listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, please like, share, and comment, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you never miss an episode. And please, you know, um, look up Calvin Young, go to his Facebook page. Um, he can be an inspiration to you, an inspiration to the world. Um, thank you again. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you.